I'm going to be speaking to you this morning about basilar tip aneurysms, um, essentially about uh, both uh, endovascular and microsurgical uh, treatment. And uh, these are a couple of disclosures, uh, neither one of which have anything to do with this presentation. Uh, to talk, give you a little background, um, everyone knows about the ISAT trial. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it was an international multicenter trial uh, which compared uh, uh, endovascular uh, treatment and microsurgical treatment for mostly ruptured anterior circulation aneurysms, grades uh, 1, 2, and 3. And uh, uh, the aneurysm had to have a suitable neck for coiling, so there has to be equipoise and death or disability at one year were endpoints. And uh, at one year, the uh, results for uh, endovascular treatment were distinctly better than uh, microsurgical treatment. And this actually uh, has been looked at in terms of uh, long-term results. There have been papers published, and they, they hold out. Uh, there were, however, um, some critiques. Uh, there were a uh, small proportion of all ruptured aneurysms that were treated. Uh, the endovascular treatment was provided by experts, whereas the microsurgery was provided uh, by um, many chief residents, et cetera, so mixed uh, expertise. Uh, so, and this was, of course, an intended treat trial, as are many randomized trials. Uh, the post hoc analysis, of course, all these trials get intensive review. Um, showed that patients under 70 years may be better served by clipping because of the uh, long-term results. Uh, the important thing about the ISAT trial is that post-recirculation aneurysms were not assessed, so they were excluded. Uh, the barrel rupture aneurysm trial, of course, uh, Cameron uh, here was the principal author of this, and uh, Robert Spetzler was involved, and uh, I think um, Robert set out to prove that uh, clipping was actually better than coiling. And uh, it was a, not, a, uh, not, not a blinded control trial, uh, which is actually one of the critiques. Patients were assigned on alternate days to clipping or coiling. Uh, 500 consecutive patients in one institution were studied, uh, and they had presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage of any cause, both anterior and posterior circulation aneurysms. The patients, uh, of course, uh, when you have subarachnoid hemorrhage, about, uh, some of them have uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage of unknown cause. They were excluded. Uh, and, of course, patients uh, were assessed uh, for suitability of coiling, and this was a very conservative uh, assessment at the time. Uh, a lot of the uh, techniques that are used commonly today were not used. Uh, so there was a high crossover rate. Uh, from coiling uh, to clipping. And however, um, at one year, uh, again, the uh, results for coiling were better than uh, clipping. And uh, the, the main critique here was, uh, was the high crossover rate. The um, results were, the results of the same group were assessed initially at one year, but then they were reassessed at three years and then at six years, and they've been uh, published. Um, at uh, three years and at six years, there is the difference between the endovascular group and the uh, microsurgical group uh, appeared to go away. Um, the main difference <clears throat> was that uh, the endovascular group are a high rate of retreatment, and this is, of course, pretty common with endovascular treatment, uh, as you'll see. Um, however, if you separated anterior and posterior circulation aneurysms, uh, the posterior circulation aneurysms uh, distinctly had a better outcome with uh, coiling as opposed to clipping, uh, despite the fact that many of them were uh, pica aneurysms, that is, uh, vertebral uh, posterior and free cerebral artery aneurysms which are traditionally thought to be easier for surgery. So um, I think that uh, the conclusions that one may draw from this was that uh, there were at six years of follow-up, there were no outcome differences. Um, coiling still had better outcomes for posterior circulation aneurysms. And of course, coiling had uh, higher retreatment rates. 
And uh, my own conclusion is that, of course, a number of people have concluded that, but it's going to be very difficult to mount additional randomized trials, mainly because uh, it's very difficult to get funding for large-scale randomized studies. So we're, I'm going to be talking to you now about a very distinct subgroup of aneurysms, namely basal or tip. Um, and uh, basal or tip constitute uh, really about around 8% of, uh, roughly about 8% of all comers, ruptured, both unruptured aneurysms. Uh, nowadays, the majority of basal tip aneurysms in many centers around the world are treated by endovascular technique. The question really is, is there still a place for microsurgery? And uh, of course, endovascular technique uh, is advancing. Now we have uh, technologies such as uh, peak phonus device and uh, pulse rider, et cetera, for broad neck aneurysms. Uh, have the techniques of microsurgery it, uh, changed and evolved? Uh, so we, we actually looked at the results of uh, basal tip aneurysms treated in our center over 10 years, and these have been published, and we're actually continuing to analyze the, the data, as I'll show you later on. So uh, we looked at the data uh, from over a seven-year period uh, from 2005 to 2012. Uh, there were 100, 100 consecutive uh, aneurysm patients. The endovascular surgery was by four operators. Uh, I have the, I'm the least of them, Dr. Gorky, who is our maestro, uh, Dr. Kim, uh, Dr. Hallam. Uh, and most of the cases in the rupture phase, they get uh, balloon-assisted coiling. Uh, and uh, a lot of unruptured aneurysms, they have a broad neck, they get stent-assisted coiling. I'll show you the differences. Uh, the microsurgery was uh, predominantly done by me, but also Dr. Kim. Uh, and it included different techniques I'll show you. <clears throat> However, there is definitely a patient selection involved, as I'll show you that. And standardized evaluation at three months and one year. And all patients had uh, post-operative uh, follow-up treatments. Uh, MRS assessment was done by a fellow or a resident who were independent of this. And then we have a very good statistician to analyze the data. <clears throat> So first I'll talk about um, the overall uh, proportions. Uh, endovascular treatment is still the mainstay is about two thirds of all the uh, treated cases. And uh, if you look at all the uh, aneurysms overall, ruptured aneurysms constitute about uh, two thirds and unruptured were just about a third. And we, uh, when we looked at the uh, data, <coughs> there really was not any uh, statistical difference in the outcomes between clipping and coiling, although there's some selection, as I'll show you. And it's, of course, keep in mind that this is not a randomized study. So how did we choose uh, patients for endovascular versus uh, microsurgical treatment? In general terms, uh, we use uh, the dome to neck ratio and the aspect ratio. Uh, and essentially what we are looking at is a treatment uh, suitable for endovascular treatment. That means does it have a narrow neck, less than four millimeters, and a, a dome to neck and aspect ratio less than 1.5 in general case. Uh, also, no branches arising from the sac of the aneurysm. And uh, age, uh, of course, uh, older age group, which we define as greater than 55 years, normally uh, get endovascular treatment. And there is a small group of patients that are not amenable to either endovascular coiling or, or microsurgical clipping, and they get uh, a different kind of treatment, which I'll show you. So again, to reiterate, there was no significant difference in the outcomes of clip and coil groups in the ruptured and unruptured cases, although the clip group was younger. And we were able to statistically adjust of course, statisticians can do a lot of things, they adjust the age, uh, and that did not affect the outcomes of the, uh, in the unruptured group. However, age in general was a significant predictor of outcomes. The, when the older, if you look at the older age group, they do distinctly better. And also, Hunt and Hess uh, grade is another significant predictor. And this is, uh, whenever you do aneurysm studies, this uh, bears across a, a group, uh, every study. Age and Hunt and Hess grade are the important predictors of outcomes. And um, uh, the clipping was with bypass or clipping and or bypass with terminal basal occlusion resulted in cure in majority cases, uh, endovascular coiling, 
required retreatment, and uh, we have actually more recent data on this. Uh, it's about almost 40% of the patients uh, do require retreatment. Of course, it doesn't mean it's, it's bad, but something to be kept in mind. A uh, number of changes uh, have occurred in endovascular surgery. Uh, some we still are not using, such as the pulse rider technology. All of these are designed to deal with the broad neck aneurysms. Mostly uh, balloons are used during endovascular treatment. Uh, there are no floor diverters specifically designed uh, for the basal or tip. We, we can use uh, Y stents. Uh, just uh, a couple of examples. This is a 51-year-old uh, patient. Uh, GCS was three, uh, so poor grade, uh, and uh, ventriculostomy was placed. And uh, this patient, uh, you can see the aneurysm here, and it was uh, coiled with the help of a, a balloon, a transform balloon. And uh, of course, 24 hours later, uh, as happens with a number of patients, after the placement of the ventriculostomy, the patient's condition uh, improved. And uh, over uh, the next uh, two to three weeks, she improved uh, considerably. Uh, fortunately, MRI showed no evidence of stroke, and she eventually had a good outcome. Here's another patient uh, with, uh, who's a younger patient. Uh, she's, uh, again, treated with a, a balloon. And uh, complete obliteration, no recurrence at uh, one year. And uh, stent and coils, uh, we have not used this um, in the ruptured phase, mainly because the need for the uh, use of dual antiplatelet therapy, except as a rescue measure. So some cases where we have uh, coil herniation, et cetera, after the treatment, we, we have to place a stent. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this is a patient with an unruptured aneurysm, somewhat of a broad neck, 53-year-old patient. Uh, we had a placement of a neuroform stent, you can see here. And uh, this is actually prolapsing into the aneurysm, which is a desired effect, and coils. And uh, the Y stent technique is uh, much more complicated. Uh, we don't use it very often. Uh, we've used it sometimes. Uh, the results in the literature are somewhat variable. Uh, overall, they seem to be worse than a single stent. Um, certainly for very broad neck aneurysms such as this, where both PCAs are at risk, uh, this is something that can be used. Of course, if you have a large uh, PCOM artery, you can also come through there and place a stent across. It doesn't happen very often. And this is a Y stent. In this case, we planned initially to use just a single stent, but there was prolapse into the right PCA, so we placed another stent to get the coils back up into the aneurysm, and this patient did uh, pretty well. Here's another patient, uh, um, probably had a sentinel bleed and came in. The initial intent was not to place coils, I mean, place a stent. But during the procedure, there was a coil herniation into the basal artery. This was toward the end. Uh, one of the earlier place coils herniated into the vessel. So we, this was a rescue, so we, we placed a stent to jail the coil so that it will not uh, cause a problem. And this, well, this patient had a good recovery. Uh, she had a partial third nerve, which she recovered nah, completely. Moving on to microsurgery. So all these things are taking place, and as I mentioned, the pulse rider technologies that will be available, is available in the U.S. right now. I don't know if you are using it. Uh, perhaps, Cameron, you're doing that or not? We're just getting the key for it. Yeah, it's, a, it's an HTE device. Unfortunately, uh, the companies, they don't want to do randomized trials. So it's an HTE device, and uh, so you have to, we're doing the same thing. Anyway, so that's a good technology, uh, possibly for broad neck aneurysms. And uh, of course, we need to evaluate large uh, groups of patients. We, we don't have that yet. So there have been some advances in microsurgery that have made a distinct difference in the way we deal with these aneurysms. So the, to go back, the, uh, the initial uh, results of microsurgery, uh, the major advances were made by two uh, very famous people. One was Dr. Charlie Drake who used predominantly a septemporal approach. The other one was Dr. Ghazi Yasegil, who used a transylvian approach. 
uh, and further advances by Dr. Winko Dolans, who introduced uh, removal of Klein art process, etc. We made a, a lot more, a uh, lot of other advances, uh, and uh, one of them is the um, uh, use of uh, skull base approaches. Skull base approaches are basically uh, approaches where we remove portions of the base of the skull to facilitate the approach to the aneurysms. Uh, the second thing is uh, dealing with the cavernous sinus, which is a venous blood containing space, can bleed a lot. We have to open the cavernous sinus in order to remove the posterior Klein art process. Uh, we deal with that nowadays by injecting small amounts of fibrin glue. We also have a device called the SonaPet ultrasonic bone curette. It makes it easier to remove the bone without damaging the surrounding vessels. Uh, we use birth suppression because we have to temporarily occlude the basal artery. Sometimes we can also induce uh, transient cardiac arrest with adenosine. Uh, the other thing that I have introduced is uh, dissect the perforators from the uh, end back of the aneurysm and you introduce a rubber dam between the perforates and the, the, uh, the aneurysm so that when you introduce a clip, uh, the clip doesn't pinch off the perforates, which is the most important danger. And then we monitor the patients with uh, motor potentials and endocyanine green angiography. All these are, everything is a small advance, but increment, it was, uh, taken together, they have made a big uh, difference. So the majority of the aneurysms are treated now by the frontotemporal and orbital transcavernous approach. But for this to happen, the, the neck has to be at or above the level of the posterior clinoid. You can take off the posterior clinoid and get a little lower, but you're coming from a more anterior or anterolateral approach. You don't have that as good a view of the back of the aneurysm. Now, the aneurysm is still very low. We still employ the subtemporal approach, but we've introduced the addition of uh, removing the petrous apex in the posterior part of the cavernous sinus. Uh, occasionally, I would divide the fourth nerve electively and resuture it. So these are all techniques. Uh, very rarely, we can use a transcolosal approach. I've used it only once in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, lastly, uh, when the aneurysm is very complex uh, and cannot be treated by any technique, we can perform terminal basal occlusion, but we augment the safety by performing a bypass into the PCA, posterior cerebral artery, so that we have good flow. So first to talk about the frontotemporal trans uh, cavernous approach, the, the main steps are frontotemporal craniotomy followed by orbital osteotomy, and then we, uh, if need be, we perform an anterior and posterior clinoidectomy. So just to show you here, so typically a, a small frontotemporal craniotomy and uh, the removal of the orbit, which is replaced afterwards. If the brain is very slack, we can also do what's called a postlateral orbitotomy. That is, we don't remove the entire orbit, but just, just the back of the orbit. So here's an example of a, a large basal tip aneurysm. The neck is, uh, you could see, well above the dorsum cella, very broad neck here. Uh, nine millimeters, the dome to neck ratio is uh, 11 to nine, and the aspect ratio is 13 to nine. So it's a, the, this is uh, favorable. Uh, this is a, also a ruptured case, so uh, it possibly could be done with a balloon, maybe difficult, may have to put a balloon and then a stent to hold it in place. So the, the aneurysm, uh, you're gonna be seeing everything upside down in this video, uh, but we were able to clip the aneurysm uh, using a, a mainly one clip and then an additional clip just for the, the residual neck. So here is the, what we're seeing under the microscope. This is the brain, the orbit has been removed and we open the sylvian fissure. And here's the carotid artery. This is the posterior communicating artery here. Third nerve is here. And uh, we're looking on the medial side of the carotid. Here's the optic nerve. And uh, this is the anterior clinoid process. I'm going to remove it because I need a little more space in this area. And that's a sonopedal sonic bone curette. And here we're injecting some fibrin glue into the cavernous sinus to stop the venous bleeding. And uh, after removing the bone, we can, uh, if need be, suture the dura back. Uh, that's a little bit of gel form laid in the cavernous sinus. 
and uh, we can so that the whole uh, obstruction created by the clinoid is uh, removed. At the same time, we have more space. Now you can see that this is a very atherosclerotic carotid. Here's the optic nerve. And we're looking medial. So here's the basal artery. In this case, I'm going to electively divide the PCOM artery. And uh, you could do that close to the PCA. Now we're seeing the opposite. Now that's the neck of the aneurysm. We're looking for the opposite uh, PCA. So we're working kind of on both sides of the carotid. No retractors in place uh, on the carotid. Some people like to put it around retractors. Here we have enough space around the basal art to place the temporary clip. So the patient is placed in burst suppression with the propofol as the temporary clip on the basal art. Here's the neck of the aneurysm. This is the right PCA. So the first clip uh, trial, the clip looks good, but I'm not satisfied or happy because I do not see the perforators on the back. So I've dissected the perforators, but I can't see them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this rubber dam between the perforators and the back of the aneurysm and uh, just using a straight clip. So first starting here and then looking on the other side to see where are the tips of the clip because this is a broad neck aneurysm, frequently we have to use more than one clip. And uh, the key is just to make sure that you're not pinching off the PCA or the perforators. And then removing the temporary clip here, and uh, then placed uh, another small clip here. We're using the Doppler uh, device to verify that there's flow in the major vessels. This is the right PCA. Uh, this is a little bit of residual neck right there. So a small clip on that one. And then um, puncturing the aneurysm, and this is uh, kind of a, something that I do most of the time, making sure that the aneurysm is uh, collapsed. And this is a ICG angiogram, making sure that all the vessels are flowing, and this is opposite PCA, basilar artery, et cetera. So, this is the postoperative angiogram. This patient uh, had a third nerve paresis, which resolved with time. Uh, her MRS, which is the modified ranking score, was excellent at three months. Uh, here's uh, another basilar tip aneurysm. However, the neck is just a little bit below the dorsum cella. So this is something that can still be dealt with from the anterior approach. And uh, so here, uh, I'm going to show you just a small uh, part of it. This is, again, right-sided uh, craniotomy, temporal lobe, and this is the frontal lobe. And we are opening the syringe fissure. I'm going to see if I can advance it. And uh, so here, what I'm doing now is removing the posterior clinoid. So that will give me <clears throat> the space to access the basal artery. So. Uh, in the old days, we used to have to use a drill, but that made it rather dangerous. But now the Sonopet ultrasonic bone curette makes it much easier. Here we're just opening up the optic sheath, and uh, that's the clinoid bone removed. And we're injecting some fibrin glue into the cavern sinus. You can see that. This, again, was a big problem in the, in the former days where we had to pack something inside injecting the fibrin glue, but you have to be careful that you don't inject too much because you can reflux into the veins in the back. Here we're using the sauna pit again to remove the posterior clinoid, and you can see, uh, but you have to protect the back with a cotinoid so that it, it vibrates on both sides. So now we clear a lot of the blood. There's a small, uh, this is actually the aneurysm, right PCA, a small aneurysm at the superior cerebellar bifurcation as well. So rem cutting some of the dura, uh, removing some additional bone. Now we have enough access to see the basal artery so we can put a temporary clip there. And uh, once that's done, here again, rubber dam into position. Uh, actually, we're starting between the SCA and the PCA. That's the aneurysm neck. Here's the posterior cerebral. And uh, the aneurysm, in this case, cauterized 
to shrink it down a bit and then placing a, a clip. So that's the post-op. <clears throat> now the subtemporal transcavernous approach, if you have <clears throat> an aneurysm which has got a really no, low neck, that is uh, here is the dorsum cella and this is the floor of the dorsum cella and this is the neck of the aneurysm, is very low. This is a gentleman again with a large basilar tip aneurysm. I think that this uh, can be coiled uh, with a stent, especially because this is not a ruptured uh, case. He just presented with, uh, uh, but he's coming from a distance, uh, not good prospect for follow-up uh, care. So this is something that I decided to, to treat with the uh, uh, microsurgical technique. So the subtemporal technique uh, traditionally employs just temporal craniotomy, pretty small or larger. But by removing the petrous apex and also the back of the, the uh, cavernous sinus, namely the, uh, the dorsum cella, the posterior clinard process from the side, you can get a, a considerably enhanced exposure. So uh, the technique as we have defined it basically involves opening the back or posterior portion of the cavernous sinus, removing this part of the bone, and again, part of the bone here, that gives you more space just to access the basilar artery and the anterior aspect of the aneurysm. So here's a case. This is kind of what you'll see here. This is the uh, temporal craniotomy and zygoma has been cut. So we're gonna be going under the temporal lobe and we've uh, kind of opened up the back of the cavernous sinus. And this is the fourth nerve. So it's gonna be right in the way of our clip. So what I'm doing is selectively dividing it rather than tearing it and then opening up the cavernous sinus more in order to remove some of the bone in this area. Once that's done, I can rotate the dura forward. And uh, here you can see the petrous apex that's being removed. This is the trigeminal nerve. And uh, we are going to be created a lot more space. Now this is the basilar artery, trigeminal nerve. This is superior cerebellar. This is posterior cerebral. This is the neck of the aneurysm, which is pretty broad. It's here and here. This is the right PCA, and this is one of the, couple of the important perforators right here. So I'm just putting a temporary clip on the basilar artery. And uh, what I don't see is the contralateral side. So the basilar artery is, is uh, soft. There's still some flow coming through the PCOM. So if I need additional softening, at the time of clip placement, I can get some adenosine arrest. Now what I'm doing is dissecting the back of the aneurysm and again, interposing the rubber dam. And uh, once this is done, I'm going to use a fenestrated clip, a clip which has got a, an opening for the posterior cerebral. Uh, so now I can see the opposite PCA. Here's the opposite posterior cerebral, dissecting off. And this is the perforators uh, being dissected off the aneurysm sac. So I'm gonna use a fenestrated clip uh, going across. And as it comes down, I can see the tip and make, making sure that the opposite PCA is not being pinched. The P1 perforators are a little bit further beyond, so we, we are okay with that. So the aneurysm is uh, clipped. Now checking with the Doppler to make sure that there is flow, and I'm gonna take off the temporary clip, and again, uh, puncture the aneurysm, uh, in this case, uh, once I can use the Doppler to make sure there's no flow. And this is the ICG angiogram in this case. And then what I'm gonna do at the end is re-suture, this is the puncture of the aneurysm. So the aneurysm is punctured and emptied, so it, we are pretty sure that the aneurysm is closed. Then uh, what I do is I re-stitch the fourth nerve back. It's not absolutely essential because fourth nerve, loss of fourth nerve can be compensated, but what I've noticed is that the majority of patients get recovery of fourth nerve function at about six months. So that's actually pretty good, you know, so that, that's that. And this is the patient with a post-operative imaging who he did pretty well at, at follow-up. Now, uh, I mentioned the cases with uh, poor um, uh, inability to clip the aneurysm as a whole. Here's a 62-year-old woman she had the diagnosis of a giant basilar tip aneurysm in 2002, which was coiled. And she had multiple coilings uh, because the aneurysm kept growing. And uh, she 
had progressive neurological deterioration. So each time the coils were put in, she'd get somewhat worse. The aneurysm was closed. So she presented to us in a very poor condition. Uh, she was alert, but uh, she was quadriparatic, could not speak. She could understand, very depressed, of course, could not eat, uh, etc. So here's a situation. Uh, the, the aneurysm had been coiled in many, many, many times. And uh, angiogram was done. And uh, we, what you can see is that the neck is still open right here in this area. And these are all the coils to have compacted. Two PCAs are seen. And uh, then there's a cyst that is formed up against the brain. She has no uh, posterior cerebral artery, uh, PCOM arteries also. So this is an isolated circulation, which makes it more difficult. So cases like this, of course, we, we discuss. Uh, I always uh, discuss with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Gorky and uh, Dr. Kim now. I have uh, another partner, Dr. Mike Levitt, also trained at Barrow. Uh, so, uh, this is not suitable for endovascular treatment, although one might think about possibly <coughs> Y-stenting, et cetera, uh, but a very broad neck. So what was done here first was to decompress the cyst uh, and uh, fenestrate the shit and assist and place a, a shunt into that cyst just to see if the patient would get better. She didn't. So in this case, what was done was... Um, a bypass into the posterior cerebral artery here. Uh, she had no radial arteries because they'd been used many times, so we used a saphenous vein. So a transpetrosal approach coming from the side, the vein graft from the vertebral artery to the posterior cerebral, and then terminal basilar occlusion just below the superior cerebellar artery. So you'll see that here, this is again uh, the, um, so this is the temporal this is a sigmoid sinus. We're looking at it from the side, retrosigmoid dura. And then we're going to open the uh, temporal area going underneath the temporal lobe. And uh, so I get to here the posterior cerebral artery. This is the P2 segment, which has been isolated for bypass. And uh, I'm going to, this is actually technically more difficult because of the depth. And here's the vein graft that's being sutured. Uh, mostly I do the distal portion first. And then once that's done, we bring the vein uh, back proximally. And this is the vertebral artery in a V3 segment. I make a, usually a punch hole to create a larger and a more controllable opening. And then the graft is sutured to it. So here's the bypass, and I'm going to release the clip. And once that's done, I'm going to, here's the SCA, and that's the basilar. And you can see the space is still very limited because of the mass of the aneurysm here. So that's the basilar artery that's being permanently occluded. And once that's done, I'm going to remove the temporary clip. Here's the vein graft. This is the fourth nerve, by the way. In this case, it was not in the way. Here's the ICG angiogram showing that there's good flow into the uh, graft. So this patient then had a, an angiogram immediately afterwards, and then she's been now followed for a number of years. She continues to have a small, very small residual neck, but uh, the aneurysm stopped growing. Uh, dramatic improvement. Uh, she was able to walk with help, etc., speaking some words, eating, and, and so on. So significant uh, improvement. So. Here's another patient, interesting case, which was treated by a combination of surgery and endovascular treatment. Uh, large uh, basilar tip aneurysm again, and you can see this uh, PCA is coming right out of the aneurysm. And uh, the actual size of the aneurysm is much bigger, so uh, no PCOM collaterals. The patient was treated by radial artery bypass and then terminal basilar occlusion. Here are the pictures, the graft being sutured. This is a bypass and then occlusion of the uh, artery. Now, after occlusion, there is still a, a residual neck here, right here. The patient had a significant hemiparesis, but improved uh, considerably over time. And we kept following him up, and uh, he had uh, fluent speech, normal cognition memory, still had a hemiparesis, but was ambulating pretty well, and uh, independently living at home. He was a policeman. Uh, however, 
Earlier this year, he developed a partial third nerve palsy. The aneurysm had grown from that residual neck, and of course, the bypass providing a lot of flow. So uh, what was done here? So here's the aneurysm, which is enlarged significantly because there is still flow coming through the bypass, and this portion of the neck is still growing. So what was done here was an Elvis uh, stent that was passed through the bypass. Here's the bypass. We were able to pass a microcatheter through this and then right across. This is just like uh, Cameron's published technique where they go through the PCOM and uh, place a stent. We just went through the bypass to place a stent and then coils. Here you can see the Elvis Jr. stent placement and then coiling of the, uh, and this patient uh, so far has done pretty well. We hope that this will provide them with permanent relief. So we uh, now updated our series. We have about 144 basilar tip aneurysms. Still, the proportions are roughly the same. Results are still holding. Five patients have had uh, bypass procedures. Two of them have had recurrent, uh, after, recurrence after coiling, and then the rest had recurrence after or not being able to be treated. In general, of the five patients, um, uh, let's see, all have done pretty well uh, in terms of their outcomes. Um, some of the, uh, these are some results with the, overall results with the entire series. Uh, if you look at the uh, clipping, we have uh, complete uh, occlusion in 91%, incomplete occlusion in 8%, Three patients died in this uh, 37. This is the original series. One was related to treatment. Two others were just because they were in poor uh, shape. Three had strokes, uh, two of which you, they were small. They recovered completely. Most of the time, the third nerve paralysis was, uh, uh, was transient. And uh, these are our cranial nerve palsies, just showing they're mostly transient. How do you avoid complications, uh, the ex experience and expertise, learning in the lab, et cetera? The most important thing are these uh, perforating vessels. The thalamogenic arteries, they have different variations, as you can see here. And if they are occluded, you get these strokes. Or sometimes you get these strokes because of vasospasm. Um, endovascular coiling, uh, the uh, number of them have a residual Next, they need to be retreated after some time. So this is very important. In this series, has 63, four died. Uh, none were directly related to the procedure. Two had uh, strokes and five thromboembolic events, groin hematoma, femoral artery pseudoaneurysm, hemorrhage along EVD tract, pretty uh, typical aneurysms. Now, uh, I'd like to show you something. Uh, most recently, we're looking at... Uh, uh, looking to uh, see the results comparatively between basilar tip and comparable group of ACOM and MCA aneurysms. Uh, and we're actually looking at the cost analytics. What are the long-term costs? And this uh, study is still ongoing. And uh, one of my residents, uh, Josh uh, Abacase, is one of my fellows there. They are doing this. Mm -hmm. So there are 37 in this group, 37 basilar tip. 158 uh, ACOM and 118 MCA aneurysms. And, uh, and what we can see is that the trends in the treatment, pretty similar down, coming down. Follow-up duration is uh, mostly, excuse me. Brian, can I call you back a few minutes? What time? What time is surgery? Okay. Yeah, let's do that. I think it's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so the the retreatment, uh, you could see that it's uh, uh, the coiling. You'll see that in a minute. So here is the recurrence and progression percentage and months to recurrence. And what you can see here, this side is a recurrence or uh, progression. And here are the months since treatment. And what you can notice is that 
the basilar tips, they tend to recur much more quickly, and a lot of the recurrence occurs within the first year uh, in this case. Uh, much higher recurrence rate, of course, in ACOM aneurysms. This is well known now. It's about 25% of the cases. The least amount of recurrence with the MCA. Of course, majority of the have been clipped. And uh, here, this is a retreatment, again, uh, much higher with basilar tip. And this is, of course, statistically significant. If you look at ruptured versus unruptured, much higher recurrence rate ruptured. This is to be expected because many of the ruptured we treat it and we try to get out as quickly as we can. Unruptured, we have a lot more options. And uh, same for retreatment. And a huge difference, of course, between clipping and coiling. Uh, so coiling uh, has about a 40% uh, cumulative recurrence rate as opposed to clipping, which is about 9% or so. And if you look at uh, the overall clipping versus coiling, what's happening over time, we had a big dip uh, in the clipping around uh, 2015, and then it sort of increased, and it's, it's kind of stabilized. Now, last this year, we still don't know, but uh, I think that some of the initial enthusiasm has been replaced by more, uh, more clipping. This study is still ongoing. We, we're now looking at the long-term cost analytics to see if these retreatments, the question here really is, uh, there are two <clears throat> issues. One is that if you're going to be saying that up to, well, 30, up to 40%, but really average 20 to 40% of the patients would require retreatment, the patient has to be informed and they should be able to come back to you. And this is a problem for us because we get patients from uh, Eastern Washington, you know, uh, Alaska, Idaho, uh, whatever, Montana. Uh, and some of these patients don't show up until they get the rupture again. So this happens. And many of them are not really uh, well informed. Even if you inform them, they, they just don't re remember what's going on. So the important thing is that when you perform coiling procedures, the patient needs to come back for follow-up. And in some cases, it may also not be allowed by the insurance companies. This is, uh, you may be finding out the same. Um, the other thing is that uh, how does that translate into cost? Because if you look at the initial cost analysis, this has been looked at the hospital costs at the moment, mainly because of the, the cost of the endovascular devices being high, they are almost equivalent, <coughs> clipping and coiling. The clipping, of course, the initial morbidity is higher than you have the additional OR cost, et cetera, but the cost of clips is much lower, versus coils and stents, price is much higher. But over the long term, because these people need more follow-up and maybe three treatments, how does that translate? So that's something that uh, you know, we are looking at as well. It may be different based on where you live, because if you live in a developing country, such as uh, India or China, et cetera, the cost of the clipping procedures are much lower because the labor costs are lower. The cost of clips are lower because they frequently will reuse the clips. We're not allowed to reuse the clips. We can use them only once. The endovascular uh, coils, et cetera, are still pretty pricey, although I, I, I presume that once uh, they start to be made in other countries, the prices will come down. So that's something that quality may also be variable. So that's another thing to be concerned about. So these are all things we're thinking about. So anyway, regardless, the, uh, the microsurgical expertise for clipping procedures is rapidly declining. So there are not many centers where uh, this is still being done. Um, of course, places like Barrow, University of Washington, et cetera, still we're doing a number of cases, but in a number of places, uh, the surgeons coming out have not even seen, for instance, a basilar tip aneurysm being clipped. Even in my own case, I say that I need to do about five cases a year just to maintain my competence. So this is kind of a, uh, an issue. So anyway, uh, we certainly think that this is not a viable uh, over the long term. I do fully believe that uh, endovascular technique will initially replace probably 80% of all microsurgery. But over a 20 to 30 year period, we're going to be controlling the genes, may even be just spraying them intravascularly so that's, we're in a transitional phase. 
Uh, so for the, the residents and people in training today, you really have to be, I have another talk, it's called Future Neurosurgery, you have to be aware of what's going on in the future. Uh, so, but at least for the time being, it looks like uh, microsurgical techniques are important, and it's very important to be in a place uh, such as this where you have all the expertise so you can discuss and see what's the best treatment. So thank you very much.